We need to bring back American manufacturing. Everywhere you look these days, society is falling apart. We used to be the technological leaders of the world, but now all of our factories have moved to foreign countries. The collapse is coming soon, and you better be ready for it. But you might be thinking to yourself, I'm just a web developer. I don't know anything about rebuilding the American industrial manufacturing base. But don't worry, I got you. This introductory video will help get you started. Okay, so once society totally collapses, you're going to be scrounging around for uh, any kind of random motor that you can find so that you can hopefully rebuild some industrial manufacturing capacity. And you might start out with a simple motor like this. And because you're a web developer, you don't have a lot of experience with this stuff. And then you think back to when you were a kid and you think, oh, can't you just uh, hook a battery up to this to get it to run? But the problem is you need to control the motor somehow through software. And you remember hearing about Arduino somewhere and that uh, they can do embedded control stuff. And so then you say, oh, great, I can, I can do this. I can just take the uh, wires from the motor and stick them into the Arduino. And hopefully that should let me manufacture stuff, right? Well, not quite. There's actually a few issues with this setup. One issue is that this is not the right type of motor for uh, fine control and positioning that you need in manufacturing. And the other issue is that the Arduino is a very low current device. It is possible to power simple things like LEDs and, and you probably could power some really small motors on the Arduino. But at some point, if you try to pull too much current through the Arduino, you will eventually fry one of the chips. So you're probably wondering now, how do you control a high current motor from a low current device like an Arduino? And that is what motor drivers are for. And one of the key observations of a motor driver is that it will almost always have its own separate power supply. So you may be used to thinking about electrical circuits in terms of just a positive and negative with the electrical current going around in a simple loop, just like in the example where the battery powered the motor directly. But with the motor driver, you can see that there are actually multiple circuits. There's a 12 volt there and a 5 volt. And of course you can connect the Arduino to this to control it. Now I also said that this is not quite the right type of motor. If you want to precisely position something like a machine, you probably want to use a motor like this, or a motor like this, or maybe a motor like this. Now if you take a look at the motor that we're used to, you can see that it only has two wires coming out of it. There's a red and a black. So getting this motor to work is pretty straightforward. There's just a positive and a negative. But if you look at these motors, they have even more wires coming out of them. This one here has four wires. This one has five and this one has five. And so these two motors both have five wires, but they don't even seem to have similar color schemes. Now I could start talking about all the different types of motors and the different uh, wiring configurations you can have, but instead I'll give you a much better way of analyzing motors that'll get you pretty far. So here I've got a motor with four wires sticking out of it, and in general you could do this analysis for any motor, and what I've done here on this piece of paper is I've just numbered uh, one, two, three, four, one column for each of the wires, and I did the same thing on the side for the rows. And what I've measured here in this table is the electrical resistance between each of the wires. And to measure each of the resistance values, I just used a multimeter. So the resistance between the first wire and the second wire is infinite, so they're not connected. The resistance between the first wire and the third wire is four ohms, and it's also four ohms between the second wire and the fourth wire, and the other two pairings are just not connected. And I won't talk about all the ways to interpret these values, but I will say that this is one of the most important pieces of information for figuring out what a given motor does. So things like the color coding on the wires, sometimes that's standard, but, but a lot of times it also seems random. And once you have a table of these values, that puts you a long way toward figuring out what type of motor you have. So it'll be easy to figure out if you have a uh, stepper motor that's a unipolar stepper motor, a bipolar stepper motor, and most importantly, the values in this table will let you figure out what kind of motor driver you should buy. And from things like the resistance values, you can figure out how much current the motor is going to take, and again, that will influence what type of motor driver you need to buy. So for example, this is a slightly cheaper, lower current motor driver, and this is a fancier, higher current motor driver. And as you can see, the higher current motor driver has a larger heatsink on it, because higher current, for a given resistance, means you're going to be dissipating more heat. And if you use a motor driver that's too small for your application, quite likely that it'll get super hot, and maybe catch fire or burn up. Now motor drivers can get extremely complicated and expensive. So as you can see, on this motor driver, there's a whole bunch of different settings that you can change. And these different settings influence how the motor moves. So for example, you might want to run it with much higher current, and that would make it much more powerful, but it would also generate a lot more heat, and it could also generate more vibrations. And obviously, if you're trying to manufacture something, and your machine has a lot of unwanted vibrations, that's going to influence your manufacturing precision. Now this motor driver here is a cheap Chinese one, but the professional ones for real industrial control can often be hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands. And the main relationship is that as you go higher current and higher power, they become much more expensive. However, you can buy all sorts of hobbyist motor drivers for uh, only a few dollars, just like this one, or like this one, 
Now, another really important concept about motors that you've probably never heard of if you're a software developer is the concept of back EMF. Whenever you shut off the power to the motor, there's a bit of stored energy saved up in the magnetic field of the coil of the motor itself. And when you shut the motor off, you can potentially get voltage spikes that go back into the, uh, the source that was powering the motor. So that could be the motor driver. And for this reason, there's the concept of the flyback diode that you can Google about. And the motor driver that you use may or may not have adequate flyback diodes. And if you've never done embedded systems development before, something you might have wondered about is why exactly do we do embedded systems development on these really primitive platforms? Because they don't have VS code, there's no Git or source control in these things. The key difference with embedded systems are usually used for real-time control applications. So if you want to switch a motor on or off, you want it to happen instantly. And if you have a full operating system scheduler running with a bunch of user applications on the hardware that's controlling the motor, that's going to cause all kinds of jitter. And if you miss certain real-time control signals because your computer is lagging, that could have catastrophic consequences for whatever you're controlling. So for example, if you imagine controlling a 3D printer stage, if the 3D printer starts lagging and extruding plastic at the wrong location, then the final result is probably going to be useless. Now in addition to motors, there's also something called servos. Servos use closed loop positioning, whereas regular motors are uh, fully open loop. So with a regular motor, you have to keep track of where the shaft is yourself. Whereas with the servo, you, you can simply instruct the servo to go to a position and it'll stop there. Okay, that's all I have time for today. The main takeaway from this video is if you want to figure out what a motor is capable of and what type of driver you should buy. If you draw one of these diagrams and figure out the pairwise resistance between all the different wires, that'll put you in a position to do further research to figure out what type of motor you have and what size motor driver you need to drive it.